Hello everyone and welcome to the fourth Elevate Education Conference that's happening here in Berlin at BART Berlin. Um, I'm very happy that you're all here and um, yeah, I'm, by the way, I'm Christine, I'm a part of the member, I'm a member of the organizing committee and Vegeta is part of it, Pauline, and then Elitza and Marga and Sarah worked so hard to make this all happen and uh, they will come a little bit later. Um, in order for you to be able to identify us, identify the team members, we plan to wear black. But now that I, I assume it would be nicer outside and people would be more colorful, but now we're all wearing black, so I guess just look at the name tag and identify us this way. Um, yeah, what else? I think at this point it would be nice to um, mention the sponsors who also made this all happen, made this all. Um, yeah, which is the Bard College Center for Civic Engagement, BCB. Thank you that we can host the conference here. And Ecolas. And also uh, thank you guys for um, sending the proposals and working on your papers. And now I just uh, hope that we will have a lot of good conversations together. And um, of course, respect each other in every way. Uh, yeah, that's it. I think now we can, I can give the word to Sajita. Okay, before I introduce our first key speaker, um, I just wanted to say that when you're in the lecture hall, we request you to put away your phones and your laptops and just have the space as strictly no electronics. But if you want to refer to the text, we have photocopies right here. And if you want to make notes, we gave you all these. But if you didn't get them for some reason, we have more. So if anyone wants Nietzsche, paper, or pen, just let me know, and I will give them to you. Um, OK, so I'm going to introduce our first speaker for the conference, um, Ulrika Wagner. Um, Ulrika Wagner is a Wissenschaftliche Mitarbeiterin at Bard College Berlin and director of the German Studies program. She received her PhD in German and Comparative Literature from Columbia University in 2012. She holds an MA degree in North American Studies and German Literature from the Free University of Berlin and was a visiting Fulbright Scholar in the Humanities Center at John Hopkins University. At Bard College Berlin, she has taught and developed courses on European and American Romanticism, Germany's Jewish Enlightenment, Literature and Culture of the Weimar Period in Berlin, the history of German literature through the lens of human-animal relationships and contemporary debates in the German public sphere. In a lecture titled Liberal Education as a Cultural Practice from Goethe and Nietzsche to Edward Said, she will be talking to us of liberal education as it broadens our understanding of teaching and learning today and the present use of historical perspective in inspiring future visions. Please join me in welcoming Ulrika Wagner. Thank you very much, Suchita. Uh, my cell phone is on airplane mode. I just, I, I'm using it as a, um, as kind of a watch. Um, I have a, I have a handout for you. Just pass this around. We're going old school here, so you can take notes while I'm talking and follow along the citations word by word. I always find that very useful. So dear students, dear colleagues, dear guests, it's a distinct honor and great pleasure to have been invited to speak to you and with you this afternoon on the topic that constitutes the intellectual foundation and the pedagogical vision of our college and many others around the world, a liberal arts model of learning. Thank you, Marga. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Suchita, Christina, and Paulina, and I hope I haven't forgotten a member of the organization, organizing, um, of the committee organizing this event. Given that you, the students, are putting together a conference on liberal education for the, first, for the fourth time already, not only shows the importance of the topic, 
but also how challenging it is to pinpoint what liberal learning is and what it is not. So it's cross-disciplinary scope, complex global history, the present and future meaning of the liberal education, its value and role in society, and its impact on social change. These diverse aspects of our conference theme are up for debate, debate and negotiation. I believe, however, that there's no better way to serve the idea of liberal learning than by doing precisely what we are doing right now, treating it as a model of teaching and instructing that we best do justice when, it, and when examining it, its past as an open one, and by discussing what liberal education means for us today as learners and as teachers, and by asking what we want for the future. To give this rich topic some direction and focus, you selected Friedrich Nietzsche's Vom Nutzen und Nachteil der Historie für das Leben on the advantage and disadvantage of history for life as the core text for this conference. The work was published in 1874, and it's the second of his four unzeitgemäße Betrachtungen, untimely observations. You asked me uh, a month ago to open this conference with a talk that travels back in time, that looks back at the past, the history of liberal learning. And Nietzsche is indeed a very good point of departure for that. He and his predecessors give us a pretty clear idea of why we are sitting around seminar tables today, why we're facing each other rather than sitting in rows like we do here right now behind one another listening to a professor who somehow elevated on a pedestal. <coughs> so lecturing from a pedestal, really, that's, that's a question. That's a matter of the past that we will travel back to when that was convention, rather, when that was the rule rather than the exception. So looking at Nietzsche and his um, predecessors and contemporary critics will tell us why we discuss paintings architecture and literary texts together <coughs> rather than memorizing and reciting sources that clearly tell us what makes up a good drama, a poem, or a work of art. Or why we consider a college entry program such as language and thinking <coughs> not a waste of time but foundational to your liberal arts student career here at Bard College Berlin. So let's take a quick look at Nietzsche before we travel back into the late 18th and early 19th centuries and also ask what critics say today about the value and use of a liberal education. What I mean by li liberal education in my talk is the pedagogic vision that developed inside and outside of the German Academy around 1800, and that was crucial for the transnational dissemination and institutionalization of, li of the liberal arts model of, for, an un of, um, for undergraduate education since the mid 19th century in America. So what makes this education a liberal one? I have found that one way to approach this question is by examining how a changed notion of the functions and uses of history has informed practices of reading, of writing, of commenting, of collecting and translating and viewing since the 18th century in Germany. The development of a new historical consciousness, in other words, strategies of engaging with and refashioning texts in a wider sense, and questions of the impact of these strategies on the self, on pedagogy, and on the social domain are codependent and need to be taken into view together. This is the assumption that undergirds my research on this topic. In On the Advantage and Disadvantage of History for Life, Nietzsche focuses on the relation between life and history. By history, he means mainly the historical knowledge of past civilizations, such as the culture of ancient Greece and Rome and the age of the Renaissance. And he also has in mind historical critical methods of scholarship, modes of engaging with the past, and our self-awareness and consciousness as historical beings. According to him, history and all its manifestations ought to always be life-promoting. Historical education, he writes, is wholesome and promising for the future only in the service of a powerful, new life-giving influence. He deplores, however, that such an understanding and use of history is very much lacking 
from the life world, he finds himself inhabiting and engaging. And one of the main targets of his critique here is the current practice of Wissenschaft, of science, of research in the academy and beyond, that he describes as overflowing with an excess of knowledge, obsessed with facts, method methodological minutia, and sophisticated analysis that bear no connection to life. And here's the longer quote, and um, I, uh, with myself, I wasn't quite sure whether I should include these longer quotes or not, and then I decided, yes, I will, because this is our core text. So you can, over the next few days, hopefully refer back to some of them. So I'll read out the first quote. Modern man drags an, dra drags an immense amount of indigestible knowledge stones around with him, on <coughs> which on occasion rattle around in his belly as the fairy tale has it here, Wodkäppchen, the little red riding hood. I, I'm sure some of you remember that story. This rattling betrays the most di distinctive property of this modern man, the remarkable opposite of an inside to which no outside and an outside to which no inside corresponds, an opposite unknown to ancient peoples. He may then say that he has content and that only the form is lacking. But in all living things, this is quite an unseemly opposition. Our modern culture, and culture gets trans, yeah, Bildung gets translated in culture. And I mean, in German, since Bildung is such a kind of distinct term, I just put it in, and, and, and I think it can't quite be <laughs> translated as culture. I just have it here in, in brackets. Our modern culture slash Bildung is nothing living just because it cannot be understood at all without that opposition. That is, it is no real Bildung at all, but only a kind of knowledge about Bildung. It stops at cultured thoughts, Bildungsgedanken, and cultured feelings, Bildungsgefühl, but leads to no cultured decisions, Bildungsentschluss. So what Nietzsche criticizes here, and in the subsequent, subsequent paragraphs, is that such an excess of undigested knowledge, to stay with that fairy tale metaphor, leads to a disconnect between content and form, inside and outside. Such an opposition exists neither in nature nor in cultures that have developed organically. To be more specific, Nietzsche sees the poetic form of an ancient drama, for instance, as inextricably linked to and as being shaped by its content, the content being everything that sort of makes up politics, worldviews, the role of the arts in, in life in the social domain. So everything sort of that constitutes our, our surroundings. Form and content are contingent upon each other, and they cannot simply be transferred to new culture and historical context without being altered accordingly in separating the two, as the French did. The French are always sort of the, the very, uh, figure quite negatively, and in, in not only in Nietzsche, but um, in uh, this whole kind of host of, of German intellectuals uh, from the late 18th to mid 19th century. So um, as the French did, by adopting, for instance, Aristotelian dramatic rules for their own 17th and 18th century theater stage, one is left with no more than a lifeless effigy of Greek theater. According to Nietzsche, this passive absorption of formless historical knowledge of French neoclassicism explains the failure of Germans to forge their own culture tradition. An exuberance of knowledge and adoption of culture productions of the past fails to save life and the flourishing of modern, of modern culture. So as you probably know, this, the language spoken at the court was French um, and, and not German for a long time. But so what? What ought to follow this diagnosis of modern man's failure to render history a vital ingredient of the present? How can history become a part of our daily lives? Nietzsche's response to this question is, of course, complex and multi-layered, but I would like to zero in on a few aspects that demonstrate, I would say, the transtemporal, geographical, and cultural commonalities that exist between Nietzsche and his assessment of the current state of Bildung and his um, agenda for how to change it on the one hand and his 18th century predecessors and then contemporary successors who very often refer back to Nietzsche on the other. So, so the Nietzsche sort of is, is a nodal point, I think, in that regard. What is crucial for cultivating a productive relationship to history, according to him, is a certain sense of obliviousness. So you need, to de you need the ability f to forget. You need to be able, as Nietzsche writes, Settle on the threshold of the moment forgetful of the whole past. Here's the second quote. We must then consider the capacity to perceive unhistorically, to a certain degree as the more important and fundamental so far as it provides the foundation upon which alone something right, healthy and great, something truly human may grow. 
So this mode of blissful forgetfulness, of striving for an undestroyable condition, is the precondition for a life-promoting use of the past. Only through the power to use the past for life and to refashion what has happened into history, aus dem Geschehenen wieder Geschichte machen, so turning what has happened into history, into a story again, does man become man. And here's the third quote. As the man of action, according to Goethe's phrase, is always without conscience, so he's also without knowledge. He forgets a great deal to do one thing. He's unjust to what lies behind him and knows only one right, the right of what is to become. So the agent, der Handelnde, loves his deed in indefinitely more than it deserves to be loved. And the best deeds occur in such an exuberance of love. So what this quick glance at Nietzsche's text shows it does, is that his understanding of Bildung, oh, I see you don't have, do you actually have, because there's more copies, and I think it's, it's more it's beneficial for you to, if you want to follow the talk, to follow this along. Um, so what this quick glance at Nietzsche's text shows is that his understanding of Bildung is actually tied to a set of capacities of dealing with and of relating to the past. The past can have a formative impact on the present when it is revived in a moment of illusion, of forgetfulness, of its complexities, refashioned by an unhistorical mind, driven by love, and empowered by the individual's imagination and creative energy. And that's the fourth quote. The historical sense, if it rules without restraint and unfolds all its implications, uproots the future because it destroys illusion. If no constructive drive, the bout is active behind the historical drive, if justice alone rules, then the creative instinct is enfeebled and discouraged. So Nietzsche's demand on the historically informed individual to not let his knowledge overrule and stifle his current actions and modes of rendering the past contemporary would have fallen on fertile ground over a century earlier. The reception and appropriation of texts was limited to techniques of imitation rather than recreation. So imitation and recreation, there's these two terms that you come across um, always in German. One is nach Ahnung and the other is nach Bildung, right? So you have the Bildung, the creation already in the term. And nach Ahnung is kind of imitation, so you imitate what you have. And Nachbildung has this more creative, active um, um, activity in the, in the world. What followed the memorization of vocabulary, grammar, and rhetorical and put it poetic rules was an example. An example demonstrating the application of rules that would then be followed by a practical exercise. So students were asked to reconstruct the text in accordance with the model text the receptive disposition and the recipient's capacities to memorize took center stage. The exercises were focused on the appropriation of linguistic conventions and textual rules rather than content. So you see why, now this is sort of the background for why Nietzsche is um, criticizing this disconnect between form and content. It's, 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 he says it's kind of not, it's antagonistic, it's, it's not really what what we should, how we should learn today. Um, it's, it's, a, a, it's a matter of the, of the past. In the second half of the 18th century, the rhetorical and grammar-oriented pra practices became increasingly unpopular and subject to criticism in Germany. New techniques of reading, drawing on the ind individual's imagination, of sort of the age after the Enlightenment, German Romanticism, drawing on the individual's imagination, perceptions, and experiences gained popularity. Ancient Greek and Roman, and Roman works were no longer just read as, an unparalleled, un, as unparalleled products of rhetorical and linguistic ingenuity worthy of imitation, but, but as authentic original expressions of an author's geist or geistless spirit. That no binding inventory of linguistic conventions would ever be able to access and unlock. Scholars and intellectuals began to now treat texts and other culture artifacts as expressions of a creative spirit, as unique incarnations of an individual's thinking and perception and at a certain time and place. And that was sort of the um, birth of what we today call the Geistes 
Wissenschaften. So, and in English, this term is usually translated as humanity. So you have the spirit, the guys, the active um, individual uh, in, already in this word. So you may be asking now, so why did this happen? Yeah, Why did the rhetorical practices come under attack? Since they worked for so many centuries, why this call for a cultural and historical informed mode of, engaging, of engagement with the past? And that would then place completely new demands on the students, on the teachers, on scholars. And of course, there are many answers to that question, but, but one is the Bible, because of new findings in religious scholarship. To consolidate the authority of the earliest religious documents, research develop, researchers developed new scholarly methods and instruments in Germany at this time. Germany was sort of the, the center of this kind of research. By doing that, however, they discovered the strangeness of ancient civilizations, civilizations that seemed so utterly distinct from their own lives. And ironically, it was at that very moment when scholars were searching to prove the Bible's divine authority that its timeless exemplary function began to be called into doubt. So figures like Johann Gottfried Herder, Friedrich Schleiermacher, all these dead white men. It's amazing I'm even allowed to talk today <laughs> since I'm only referring to these guys. And Johann Gottfried Eichhorn would treat the Bible as a culture rather than divinely inspired document, a book recording people's religious experiences and composed by humans for other humans. So the, the actual impulse was, was a different one, right? You wanted to find sort of the true version of the Bible. That's why you have sort of this almost kind of X, what Nietzsche then describes as an excess of knowledge, right? There's all these different versions, and, um, but what they found was not what they were actually then looking for, yeah? So this changed status of the Bible, its transi transition from being treated as a divine to a culture document, helps you see, perhaps, why the ways in which people would refer to texts from the past changed. If there is no such thing as an original, divinely author authorized text, the way to actualize, to transfer the scriptures into your own time can't be by way of reciting and memorizing them. Rather, you need to be able, you need to take the text as a point of departure, as a source of inspiration to forge your own religious experience and understanding in your own time, in your own place, your own life. Only by means of such an act of reception can religion become a matter of the present, rather than the past, and the text life-promoting, rather than a lifeless historical document. The classical scholar Friedrich August Wolf transferred these methods of biblical criticism to the field of classical studies in the Prolegomena at Homerum, Hom um, Homerum, the Prolegomena to Homer, he made in, that was in 1795, and he made very similar discoveries with, uh, with regard to Homer's poetry, dethroning its authority while they were also preparing the path for a wholly new technique of reconstituting Homeric poetry. Wolf suggested that the poetry of Homer is, like the Bible, is a, com a composite of vastly different text collections stemming from, a, from multiple origins and an oral cultural tradition. And if you want to be as great as the Greeks, if you want to be, if you want to imitate them, you better find new creative ways than reciting and imitating them. So you have to make this kind of transition from Nachahmung to Nachbildung. Because if you see them as unique expressions of a particular time and place, then their authenticity kind of can only be revived if you do the same thing in your own time. So it's no longer just enough to copy. And figures such as Goethe and Herder, and actually most German romantics in one form or another, uh, one of the most famous uh, classical scholars that you might have heard of is Johann Joachim Winkelmann, they were sort of key developers and promoters of this new life-promoting textual practice that kind of filled a vacuum of disillusionment, disillusionment with the scholarship on religious and classical texts that the set of scholarship had created. Because you can imagine that it's kind of quite an unsettling experience. If all of a sudden someone tells you that the text you believe was sort of divinely inspired and di directly sort of given to you by God is actually kind of a composition of all these different texts from um, various origins. So that vacuum somehow needed to be filled, and the romantics were right there to, to do that, to take on that challenge, to take on the job. <coughs> 
So um, how does essay on on Ossian and Goethe's essay on architecture, both published in this collection on German character and art in 1773, exemplify characteristic features of this new historical, critical, as well as creative poetic method. And in this excerpt from an exchange about the letters um, about Ossian, uh, sorry, I don't have a translation of this, that's why it's um, in German on your handout. Um, Hannah criticizes uh, Michael Denis poems as an example for a failed translation. So um, he, he took, a, he took an, um, a translation and said it doesn't, that from, from his time period, had it and said, well, that doesn't work because it doesn't sufficiently take into consideration the poetry's original vibrant and spontaneous form. Because without taking the inter in original context within which the poetry developed into consideration, Denis corsets the English original into a static hexam um, hexametri hexametric, the hexameter was sort of the, the, the common verse used, um, into a poetic scheme. And there's multiple texts, by the way, oh, versions of Homer where the same happened as in the French context, right? Where sort of everything that seemed messy about Homer was sort of shoved aside and so as to find the true classical work. And precisely those kind of translations um, that were supposed to make the original text better, then of course uh, came into it uh, under attack because the whole um, thought was this, this doesn't work, we can't do that. We, we, they just, they're products of a specific time in history and it's not on us to change them as moderns. The poetry's educational potential thereby fa fails to flourish in the translation. It fails to realize how does main objective, that is to animate the creative capacities of the contemporary recipient and serve as a point of departure for directing the individual's attention to beauty and the lifeliness of his own world. According to Herder, activating the individual's dormant potentials should be the goal of all education and training. Like Nietzsche, 100 years later, Herder's assessment of the contemporary condition of institutions of learning is rather disillusioned. And that's the quote, and what is, I'm not going to read it out, but what he's saying is pretty much, it's, it's very similar to what Nietzsche says, that. Um, we're all kind of doomed, but of course they have their reform project anyway, and they set it up against this very negative um, perspective, uh, um, kind of outlook on the current state of Bildung, which they find quite disastrous. So it seems like not much has changed between Herder in the late 18th century and, and then Nietzsche in the late 19th century. Departing from rhetorical and grammar-based methods of instruction, Halder advocates in his essay and a lot of other writings for a new reading pedagogy. And that is conceptualized as a learning process and as such broadens the traditional Greco-Roman text canon fundamentally. What constitutes the strategy's strength is, it, is its inconclusiveness on both sides. So what makes the text, the text attractive in the first place is its open and vital composition which in turn corresponds to and has a feedback effect on the continuously changing perceptions and emotions of the recipient. Yeah, so that's why in your classes you keep returning to the same text over and over because there's this assumption that the text is inconclusive and so are you as its reader, yeah? So there's always a new entryway, there's always a new moment that, that, you, that will um, allow you to, in the reading process, to kind of uh, gain a new perspective, um, a new experience of, of reading. And this is where it's, it's coming from. This is when this developed. Goethe's essay on German architecture trans transfers that same strategy to the domain of architecture. The piece is normally read as the found founding document of the German Sturm und Drang period, celebrating the rejection of neoclassicism, the genius cult, and the rediscovery of the Middle Ages. If you look at Goethe's essay in the context of Herder's own programmatic, however, the Ossian essay is the first one in the collection volume, followed by Goethe's text. You notice that Goethe takes his cue here from Herder. He develops a practice of viewing that is in accordance with Herder's agenda. Goethe finds that general categories of taste and knowledge of the details of Gothic architecture do not sufficiently accommodate the experience of looking at the Strasbourg Cathedral. A new approach is necessary that the author of the text first needs to learn himself. And that's the quote number six on your handout. When I first came to visit the cathedral, my head was filled with general notions of good taste. 
based on what I heard, what I had heard others say. I praised the harmony of mass, the purity of form, and it was a sworn enemy, and I was a sworn enemy of the confused arbitrariness of Gothic adornment. Under the heading Gothic, as in, as in an entry of the dictionary, I listed all the synonyms, misconceptions that I had ever encountered, such as indefinite, disorganized, unnatural, patched together, tacked on, overlapping. No wiser than a nation which calls the world it does not know barbaric. I called everything which, I, which did not fit into my system Gothic. So his categories of perception are formed by French neoclassical taste, suggesting that Gothic equals barbaric. What, what then gradually replaces these categories is a historical perception of the cathedral, and the engagement with the building becomes an empathetic, sensuous experience, and that's this quote number seven on your handout. But what unexpected emotion seized me when I finally stood before the edifice? My soul was suffused with a feeling of immense grandeur, which, because it consisted of thousands of harmoni harmonizing details, I was able to savior and enjoy, but by no means understand and explain. You have this moment of inconclusiveness again, that it's the same as in the realm of in the domain of literature. The cathedral leaves an impression on him that he cannot comprehend. He does not have a language available to categorize and accommodate his perceptions. Similar to Winkelmann in his famous essay on the imitation of Greek works, or Helder in the Ossian essay, or other publications on fragments of Greek and Hebrew poetry, Goethe responds to this experience of linguistic paralysis with a new language of affect and emotion, and he thereby adopts a new role that resembles that of artists and writers. And that's the eighth quote on your handout. Few have been blessed with a mind capable of conceiving a Babel-like vision, whole, great, inherently beautiful to the last detail like God's trees. And even fewer with the good fortune to encounter a thousand willing hands, to excav excavate the rocky foundations, to conjure up towering structures, and with their dying breath, tell their sons, I will remain with you in the works of my spirit. Complete what is be begun until it reaches into the clouds. So this quote is taken from the opening paragraphs of the essay, where Goethe pays tribute to Erwin von Steinbach, who was at this time believed to be the architect of the cathedral. Interestingly here, the Babel-like vision, which is normally, you know, think of the Tower of Babel, that is normally associated with human hubris, is linked here to the, to man's continuous, to the continuous productivity of the human mind. In Goethe's eyes, Steinbach activates a creative impulse in the viewer and critic that echoes that of the architect. The architect continues to live on in what he designed because of the productive energies set in motion in the process of reception. I will remain with you in the works of my spirit. Complete what is begun until it reaches into the clouds. Yeah, sort of the continuation process is inscribed in the, in the, in the, um, in the building itself. Again, you hopefully we kind of see, since you're all interdisciplinary scholars, how, how similar this is to what's happening in literature. And that it often doesn't make sense to think of, really, of think of disciplines in this time. There's such a common kind of shared approach here to, uh, to reading, something that developed in the realm of text, but that is uh, easily transferable and got adopted by other domains, art criticism in particular. It is illuminating to discuss Goethe's approach against the backdrop of recent critical literature on textual practices, or to use the term often used to designate a wide range of approaches to texts, philology. The practice that Goethe introduces and exercises in some ways meshes with what the Germanist Hans Ulrich Gumbrecht in The Power of Philology considers integral to our philological work. Grumbrich argues that philological activities, that is the identification of fragments, editing, the composition, um, of uh, the composition on commentaries that accompany text, texts, always resemble the creative work of writers and poets to a greater or lesser extent. Translations, collections, and editions bear their author's signature. This affinity between poetic arts and scholarly investigations stems from the fact that any philological practice is underwritten by a structure of desire. And you might 
should know what this experience is like when you read a text and all of a sudden there's almost like a bodily response, right? So you find something and your heart makes that leap and your face blushes and that's kind of, that's, that's what he calls desire, right? So you want to understand, you want to make sense, you want to kind of create a whole for the time being. You want to write a comprehensive um, essay with a cogent argument. Okay, so um, <clears throat> this affinity between poetic arts and scholarly in investigations stems from the fact that any philological adjective, yeah, is, the, sorry, this was a repetition, the structure is sort of underwritten by the structure of uh, desire. Driven by the impulse to render the object and author under, in investigation, under investigation present, the philologist seeks structures of coherence between, sec um, <laughs> between textual fragments and attempts to give them shape. He draws on his imagination to fill out empty spaces surrounding the materials and thereby exercises power over them. Drawing on the Benjamin philology, Gumprecht argues that the critic endows the object he singles out over the course of his inquiries with an aura of exclusivity and terms, turns them into a sort of semi-sacred objects. I would suggest that Goethe does exactly that with the Strasbourg Cathedral in his essay. He seeks to render the building present in a coherent and unified fashion, bestowing a quasi-sacred aura on the imaginary act, and usurping thereby the place of the architect, the creator. So now when we look at these two, the use of Nietzsche's, uh, to, use, uh, to use Nietzsche's term again, these life-giving, life-promoting engagements with historic, historical works, so uh, Goethe's architectural one and Herder's literary one, it's quite obvious that historical facts and inaccuracies in representing them get shoved aside or ignored altogether, both intentionally or unintentionally. Erwin von Steinbach was, uh, Steinbach was not the architect of the cathedral and even more significant, as you might have, I assume, at, in some of your core classes, maybe you came across Ossian before. Ossian's poetry is an ingenious invention of an 18th century Scottish poet. And Haller was familiar with James McPherson's um, Ossian forgery. And it's hardly possible to assume that someone as well versed in the field and up to date with the latest research as Hadda would not have recognized that the poem which McPherson claimed were of ancient origin, the poems which he claimed were of ancient origin were actually modern and modern invention. It is therefore quite safe to assume that Hadda simply decided to ignore the doubts surrounding the, po the poem's originality. I would go as far as to argue that his pretended ignorance is a conscious act of, Nietzschean of, of, of the Nietzschean obliviousness, that Hadda also propagates and practices in other writings. There are quite a few instances in his works where, he, where obvious mistakes in research, sloppiness, generalizations, conflations of fact and fiction become secondary matter for Hadda the historian. To be sure, he's been criticized for that already by his contemporaries, but, we leave, but if we leave it at pointing out these so-called failures of research, we miss out on what I think is a very important aspect of his educational agenda. agenda. Sometimes the value of the debates about poems, such as the ones by Ossian, does not reside in their correspondence with historical facts. Rather, Herder is interested in the contemporary use to which history, real or imagined, is put. The life-promoting resonance of the reception process and the humanist objectives for which the sources are instrumentalized take center stage. And their factuality and questions regarding their actual origin come second. Herder emphasizes the culture-critical functions of Ossian's poetry in, <coughs> in his essay and discuss it at length how they countermand and impact contemporary notions of taste and artistic standards. So it fit, they just fit really well into what he wanted to do. And that's why he decided to ignore um, their actual set of modern history. How does writings of Winkelmann, by many, and Winkelmann, you, I assume that you, maybe you read his famous essay on the, on the imitation of Greek artworks at some point. Um, and he's, he's by many considered the founder of, of art criticism. Yeah, he's an, uh, this, the writings by Hadda and Winkelmann are another example for that. To be sure, Hadda does not refrain from criticizing the mistakes and the historical distortions in Winkelmann's writings. 
At the same time, however, he recognizes that Winkel, what Winkelmann has done for the humanities, what his research has contributed to developing a completely new way of engaging with art, architecture, and poetry. Moreover, he measures the value of Winkelmann's work by the extent to which it has helped him take on the unfolding and cultivation of his selfhood as a lifelong project. So his primary interest lies in illuminating how Winkelmann uses his immersion into a bygone era as a vehicle and solid point of orientation for his own self-realization. Interestingly, in light of the determination and success with which he makes use of the ancients, it is not a pressing concern for Hörde that these reconstructions are imaginary ones. He is interested in how Winkelmann puts historical considerations into the service of a humanist project of self-formation. He supports and authorizes Winkelmann's idealizing reconstructions because they help him find a place in the world. Furthermore, Helder proposes that Winkelmann's mode of putting his scholarship into the service of his self-fashioning left a major impact on the history of the discipline, the, the discipline of classical studies. The classical scholar Catherine Harlow suggests, suggests that Winkelmann's role in the disciplinarization of the science of antiquity exemplifies the centrality and contested nature of humanist considerations in German debates. Winkelmann, with his highly idealized and aestheticized views of ancient Greek culture, has the status of a founding spirit in the university discipline of classical studies, Altertumswissenschaft. His seminal position, however, is not so much due to the enduring value of his scholarship, but rather to the exemplarity of his life. In other words, it's the co close connection Winkelmann fashioned between his life, his character, and his scholarship that earned him his lasting reputation as a founding figure of the field of classical scholarship. And this is really something that also classical scholars are only sort of really acknowledging now. This is really um, up-to-date research, um, and, and we'll get to why, why that is, why it's been ignored for so long, sort of the link between character, between kind of the self-fashioning of the scholar um, and, and how he, how, what kind of an impact that leaves on a, on a field, on a <coughs> discipline. Reviewing critical literature and documents on the history of the discipline of classicism and philology, Harlow draws into focus the pervasive and lasting impact of Winkelmann's imaginative orientation toward the past. And the paradigm shift that um, classicism began to undergo during Christian Gottlob Heine's tenure at the University of Göttingen. And Heine was a very renowned classical scholar and an archaeologist at this time. Echoing Winkelmann in their research and pedagogy, Heine his, and his former student Friedrich August Wolf, professor of philology and pedagogy at the University of Halle, and Ulrich von Wilamowitz Möllendorf, professor of classical philology at Göttingen in the late 19th century, and former fellow student of Nietzsche and his rival, um, they studied the ancient past holistically, kind of did what Nietzsche asks for in his, um, in his text. Rather than promoting a narrow, exclusive, text-focused approach, they consider Altertumswissenschaft as the study of Greco-Roman civilization in its essence and in every aspect of its existence. Such an inclusive investigation of antiquity, employing different interpretive approaches and drawing on a wide range of ancient cultured productions, however, were also subject to fiercely contested debates that reached far beyond academic institutions. As Harlow's study demonstrates, Heine was not only influenced by Winkelmann, but also one of his most skeptical 18th century critics. He did not hold back in pointing out the methodological shortcomings and historical flaws in Winkelmann's reconstructions. Heine found fault with his overactive imagination, and, becomes, and it becomes obvious that the two had very different ideas about the limits and permissible interpretation in the, in the project of reconstructing antiquity as a whole. So these examples epitomize the ongoing battle over the scope and adequate practice of reconstructing the past. Such disputes took place not only between trained researchers with university appointments and figures with influential public voices, uh, with influential voices in the public sphere, like Winkelmann and Herder, but are indicative of 19th century classical scholarship in the academy and beyond. In her comparative discussion of programmatic writings on classical scholarship,
Constanze Gutenke demonstrates that questions concerning the range of the objects of specialized research and the role that conjecture and intuition should play in recovering the ancient world were subject to constant negotiations. And there's a famous culmination of this continuing debate in the early 19th century uh, that Nietzsche also refers back to between August Berg, also a professor of classical philology at uh, the University of Berlin and uh, later on at Humboldt University, and Gottfried Hellmann, a professor of eloquence in Leipzig. And Burke was the one who advocated for a holistic and methodological broad approach recapturing the ancient past, involving sharply analytical as well as more associative ca imaginative categories. And um, Hellmann, by contract, uh, contrast, said that the philologist should just focus on grammar and style and textual criticism and not go beyond. These examples should suffice to give you a glimpse into how fundamentally and pervasively our ways of working with texts in the broadest sense has changed since the late 18th century, transforming, transforming not only how we read, comment, translate, and write about literature, but also how we view, discuss, and write about art and architecture, and how we, how we relate these activities to uh, domains of engagement. The role of teachers and students has changed. And if you want to learn more about how the German 19th century university formed and the founding of American institutions of higher learning, I recommend a book. It came out in 2017 with the University of Chicago Press, and it's called The Rise of the Research University, a source book. And this book is a collection of original documents that give you a pretty good idea of how these early, early formulations by people like Schleiermacher and many of the names I, I've sort of been referring to over the course of this uh, talk come up in this book and how they echo in plans for higher education. So obviously it's, it's a complex process, but what I've been discussing here has certainly been sort of a very formative um, element in this whole process of the uh, American liberal arts undergraduate education curriculum in the humanities. I'm talking about the sciences, that's a different topic. The 19th century German university was especially important for American universities and the institutionalization of the liberal arts model. The key reformers of American higher education in the second half of the 19th century, they either studied in Germany or cited what they took to be the German university model. So what didn't really become institutionalized in Germany, uh, sort of really became, um, was these, these ideas then um, took root and um, were foundational to the American education system, which is quite interesting that um, with Bart now here, being here, that it sort of has come back in a way. Um, because Germany sort of has this rich intellectual tradition, but in terms of institutions um, that really try to uh, um, integrate these visions into a curriculum, uh, that's, that's a fairly new development in Panko, I would say. Anyway, <laughs> so the holistic study and appropriation of texts and cultural objects by past or otherwise foreign civilizations gained a lot of popularity and revolutionized humanist research. At the same time, however, as I already mentioned, it was also subject to, f to battles and cr to, to uh, criticism. Associative imaginative reconstructions reverting to conjecture and the popularization of research, those stra strategies are all seen as potentially endangering the credibility of the field that prides us itself on being wissenschaftlich, that prides itself on using sharply, on, on being sharply and analytical and, and fact-oriented. But quite interestingly, I mean, you, you kind of have, have that kind of antagonistic relationship already in the title, the guys and the Wissenschaft, right? The spirit and the science somehow in there. Um, so uh, it is interesting, however, that it's precisely this aspect that has become this sort of these elements that are hard to pin down and that are somehow, um, yeah, that are vague rather than precise, uh, that, that have become the object of many recent studies uh, on the, the history of, of the humanities. And there are many reasons for that. I don't have a one straightforward answer for why that is, but um, the book that I cited earlier by the Germanist Gumprecht as well as other current research on the topic suggests that it is particular the question, particularly the question of contemporary broader public relevance of humanist research that we need to examine and invest in. 
The intellectual historian Sheldon Pollock, for instance, who conceives of philology as the discipline of making sense of texts, emphasizes its eth ethical and pedagogical potentials. When practiced comprehensively, philology makes available to us different conceptions of what it has meant to be human, and it helps us cultivate solidarity, self-awareness, and a pluralistic understanding of truth. And similarly, Peter André Alt, Germanist and former president of the Free University, discusses how working with texts and various origins makes a, quote, plurality of versions of reality accessible, sharpening thereby our awareness for the temporality and volatility of what we take to be natural and stable, and thus take for granted in our own social life worlds. And Edward Said refers explicitly to Nietzsche with his invocation to return to philology, published in 2004. Echoing Nietzsche, he discusses the work with texts in the broadest sense as a humanist core activity and emphasizes the connection between history, between the life world of the writer and contemporary life. And that's the quote number nine on your handout. The literary text derives, true enough, from the assumed privacy and solitude of the individual writers. But the tension between that privileged location and the social location of the writer is ever present. Whether the writer is a historian, like Henry, J Henry Adams, a relatively isolated poet, like Emily Dickinson, or a renowned man of letters, like Henry James, there is no way at all of focusing on either the original privacy of the public place or the writer without examining how each of them comes to us whether by curricular canon, intellectual or critical frameworks provided by a presiding authority, immediately then the constitution of tradition and the usable past comes up. And that in turn leads us inevitably to, identify, to, to identity and the national state. So Edward Said goes very, very far with this approach. Um, if, you read, if you read the essay, you'll see what I mean. And, but in many ways, what he says also resonates with Alt and Pollock and Gumprecht because he emphasizes the pedagogical and emancipatory potentials of, of reading. And this is the last quote, humanism is about reading. It's about pr perspective and in our work as humanists, it is about transitions from one realm, one era of human experience to another. It is also about the practice of identities other than those given by the flag or a national war of the moment. That deployment of an alternative identity is what we do when we read and when we connect parts and when we go on to expand the area of attention to include widening certain uh, circles of pertinence. So I hope that this talk has not only provoked more questions but also answered some with regard to the history of liberal learning. But in any case, um, please bring on all your questions and comments now. Yeah, thank you. combination of um, like practicing artists um, that is using research mm -hmm. um, as a method of working mm -hmm. uh, and then maybe there is like a possibility to combine it with um, an academic form or like an, this academic form, this classic one. So I mean, I'm not sure if it's like a maybe a question or a comment, but maybe we can find like within the text as well or maybe like the, the specific link between um, what Said is saying and what Nietzsche is saying, um, we can find a place like for <coughs> the artist, um, <coughs> some kind of like a, this common ground that, um, or actually yeah. like the opposite completely, like I mean, where, where we can find here like the place for the artist, uh, the contemporary artist. Actually. Yeah, yeah. 
Does anyone want to comment on that or follow up on directly? Yes. Like um, I think Nietzsche almost uh, explicitly includes the artist right. as they who are the creator and destroyer of the history. So yeah. in this production of possibility of the future, mm -hmm. the curation of history is art. And so this exteriorization yeah. is artistic. Also. Right. Yeah, I think for all these thinkers, it's sort of, in a way, inherent. Because when you deal with history, right, they're obviously criticizing what I pointed out earlier yeah. as sort of this old rhetoric-oriented um, a uh, model of, of approaching history, um, that it's somehow, no matter what you do, you have to find a way to, to link it to your life world and thereby you, conti you continue this kind of active process that is the foundation for any artistic production. Mm -hmm. And you cannot really separate the two out. And at the same time, of course, because we're still, we call this field a Wissenschaft, right? There, it's always a fine balance. Where yeah. does sort of this imaginative reconstruction end? Where does it become almost arbitrary right. and unrelated, right? So that's, and I think this is a question that you as an individual, you're responsible for yeah. that because yeah. you're inserting yourself into a discourse, mm -hmm. into a scholarly discourse. But at the same time, it's something that we cannot completely ever bracket out, right? right. Which often, especially if in, in the history of my field, like uh, German studies, that uh, the way I, I um, experience it in Germany is often ignored, even though it's because I think there's also a certain anxiety that, that, that is sort of connected to that, obviously, because you don't want to be an artist, you want to be a researcher. But it is something that we have to, to always reflect and, and be conscious of. Can we be both and, at right. the same time? And I think, especially in America, you do. You have these figures who have really, because of how they also connect, and this is perhaps provocative to say that, but how they have been able to connect their scholarship, their lives, and their sort of, they've really kind of invented a language for a access, accessing a certain historical um, period and have become <laughs> popular figures to the state of being cult figures precisely by doing what Winkelmann did back in the 18th century. Yeah. Right. And that needs to be historicized, or that we, we need to see that as part of the history of our fields and the humanities, I would say. And there's a whole sort of group of scholars that has been trying to do that recently. That maybe can practice it also in the museum and not only um, in, like in the humanities, I mean, the university or yeah. the academic field or discourse, but also outside of it, and yeah. somehow like popular culture and in in the museum, in the gallery, yeah. in TV, whatever, like in the, so in cinema. So I mean, it's some some kind of like finding this link. Yeah. I think it's important. Yeah. Thank you. Maybe I can get everybody going. I'm not a student, so I <laughs> go on too long. But um, if you. How would you how would you react to a, a somewhat I hope provocative claim along the lines of you if you look at this sort of spectrum between let's say scholarship and artistry or creativity mm -hmm. if you see it you yeah. know sort of what I'm referring to right um, if you look at that and then you look at a figure let's say like Nietzsche or maybe some of the earlier figures that you cited, Herder, um, who were either sort of going against a, what we would now see maybe a sort of naive belief in the authoritative text, the original yeah. text, right? You the, gave the example of the New Testament, which was, which was crucial. Um, or who were going against a sort of a dry, positivistic, fact-driven mm. approach to uh, the sciences in general and philology in, in particular, which is mm -hmm. part of what Nietzsche was rebelling yeah. against in yeah. Basel, right? Um, the, the claim would be, well, isn't, well, the, the, the question would be, aren't we in sort of the, the, the opposite of that, of that uh, phase historically, if you look at uh, the sort of continuities that are being created within uh, scholarship, what you were just referring to, and maybe the dangers that that might uh, face, and then more sort of globally speaking, if you're looking at you know anything from 
fake news as mm. to perhaps sort of mm. uh, facile claims to the relativity of, of knowledge, right? Mm -hmm. um, isn't the danger sort of the opposite mm. now from some of the stuff that Nietzsche or Herder was uh, facing? Well, I think that's so do we need less mm -hmm. creativity and more sort of dry scholarship, I guess is a mm -hmm. stupid way of putting it. Mm -hmm. you know it's funny because <laughs> I think it's a, this is a really good and smart question and I, I was actually thinking about this whole fake news debate um, as I was preparing this, this talk. And I think again, with regard to Nietzsche and Herder, yes, we need to historicize and see where they were coming from at this point and what, what was happening at the academy and outside of it, where really there was this excess of knowledge. There was all these facts, but it wasn't interesting, right? It was a constant accumulation of knowledge, but no story kind of created with that. And that's how they developed sort of their stance on it. Um, and by the way, this is just a footnote, but. What today we consider disciplines at this point didn't really exist. That really happened in the late 19th century when Nietzsche was writing. That people like Hada wouldn't probably today, not maybe again today, but not hardly get a job, right? Because they were so prolific, so active in so many different fields, wouldn't even make that distinction. That's by the way, that's why I also keep stressing that art history and 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 literary scholarship and um, looking at artworks, that they were so interconnected also with regard to their methodol methodologies that today when we talk about interdisciplinarity, um, we actually need to also look back into what happened prior to disciplinarization. Okay, so this is not, was not a, this is just kind of a comment that I think is relevant um, to contextualize and historicize uh, the, the, the 18th and 19th century. And with regard to today, um, I think in the, they, we perhaps need to distinguish here between the public <laughs> domain on the one hand and what's happening in the academy um, on the other. And here I, I, I do think that we need to become more aware of how arbitrary and how yeah, kind of ahistoric, like ahistorical almost in a way, our rigid disciplinary divisions are, right? So when we keep insisting, oh, what I'm doing is so different from what is happening in art history, that we need to somehow overcome that or really see the, the connections without stepping too much on each other's territory, but um, think more interconnected and see that this is historical and this is not a fancy modern invention that we've come up with and we think, oh yeah, we are so, um, we cross boundaries all the time. So in that regard, I don't think it's really the opposite of what happened uh, in the 18th and 19th century, but more um, a kind of reinvigoration and, and, and rethinking of our hi own history in the humanities. But with regard to the broader public, um, yes, I think to create this awareness of the danger of imagined reconstructions of some kind of past narrative is, um, is, is absolutely crucial. And I think it's also crucial as teachers for us to draw attention to that precisely by discussing the history, by becoming, drawing, aware, like making students or ourselves also aware of um, of why we're doing what we're doing, where this is actually coming from. Because sometimes I have I get these puzzled responses in L and T, uh, <laughs> language and thinking at Bard, where we do ask students to connect an image with a fragment from a text and say, just make something out of this, make fashion these connections, right? And this is precisely, I would say, in a way, what these critics in the 18th century ask for, like do that, but at the same time, be aware of what you're doing and what your limits are and be a responsible scholar as well. So I think it's something that, that um, always needs to be thought together and cannot be separated out. This creative drive on the one hand and your responsibility as a critic. Does this <laughs> It's a long reflection. <laughs> yeah. So, so, um, so when you say we need to historicize yeah. Nietzsche or Herder, 
uh, or we need to historicize the discipline. Yeah. When you unpack that need. The we? The need. The need, okay. Can I ask you to unpack that need? Yeah. Because right? when I listen to you right now, it actually sounds like there are two needs mm -hmm. that might, in, in your view, I don't know, be fortunately, you know, together. Say more about the two needs. Well, one is something about moral responsibility, and the other is about objectivity. Mm -hmm. It sounds like, in listening mm -hmm. to you. But just since Nietzsche is our text, like, I just wonder, like, is the need a need for life? Or is the need a need for objectivity? What, is, what do you mean by we need? I really, see, I, I really see the, think that they are co-dependent. You cannot completely separate them out. I, I thought, and maybe this is totally wrong, that what you were saying was that there's sort of this big divergence, which I think is true between, and this is you know, something that people like me have said a long time ago about you know, modernity and, and, and enlightenment in general, right? This big divergence between um, more and more knowledge but specialized and to some extent isolated and we don't yeah. really explain it, although we can't really explain it, although we use it all the time. And on the other hand, this sort of resurgence and, and overwhelming power of myth-making everywhere, right? Including all sorts of false narratives yeah. and all sorts of things that are not straightforwardly false. And that maybe um, sort of the job of the liberal arts is to, uh, first of all, mark that, that situation as something that needs constant um, self-awareness and, and also sort of correction on both sides, right? So that some, of, some people do that by, by making education less um, on the side of just the sort of amassing of, of technical knowledge and others do it by uh, popularizing, but each is mm -hmm. dangerous and can fall into its own uh, traps, especially the popularizing, right? It can become another type of myth making. So that, that it's not yeah. exactly the same challenge, but it's also not two separate ones. That's how I understand. No, you're absolutely right. I mean, I just um, I, I <laughs> was surprised. A, a friend of mine sent me the biography of someone who was just recently hired at a major American research university. And I looked at this woman's profile, and I was amazed. I mean, how she is an artist, and she is a performance artist, and she writes poetry, and she's engaged in all these theater projects. And this was for an assistant professor position. Um, and also has publications, but it's sort of this, this completely new profile, you know, that even a few years ago, I, I maybe I was just blind to it, but I, I hadn't encountered it before. So I thought, well, this is obviously, there's a change here. They, they, a major research university is hiring someone who is also an artist. And when I was a graduate student, this would have all, almost, maybe this was this conservative department, by the way, it, was, it would have been completely frowned upon, saying like, this is not weird. We are scholars. Like that's a different domain. Yeah. Um, but Tanya, you wanted to say something. Yeah. Um, I would just since we're on the topic of historicization and the kind of the need to um, source these these different ideas and about disciplines. Um, I'm also kind of I guess trying to figure out where you fit in then the fact that a lot of liberal education, even with disciplines, actually developed much earlier before Nietzsche was writing, before Sayyid was writing in the Indian subcontinent and in North Africa, in what we know today as the Middle East, where they had legitimate learning centers that attracted mm -hmm. people from around the area and they developed these ideas um, far before, as you said, these dead white men were writing, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And I, so I guess I'm trying to figure out where that fits into the equation of historicization of these ideas mm -hmm. because I, from what I understand, also these centers had developed disciplines and had mm -hmm. kind of uh, developed very um, uh, strong programs to do with liberal mm -hmm. education and astronomy and the mm -hmm. humanities and arts. So I'm just trying to contextualize that. Well, I think there's a research topic. <laughs> yes, um, absolutely. <laughs> because, you know, actually, that's just this book that I cited, published by one of the <laughs> most respected presses, University of Chicago Press, that really stresses that, that German um, sort of connection. And since I am, you know, where I'm coming from, from this German context, and I've sort of done all this, this research from sort of the German um, context and then reaching to other European countries and, and North America, uh, that I think 
would be another project that, that needs to be that I know unfortunately close to nothing about. What was happening on the sub-Indian continent, I once had a student who's here, Maria Khan, who uh, did a, some research on that, I think, back then, and who taught me a lot about um, poet, poets from, from Pakistan and other countries who were influenced by uh, German, also German Enlightenment thinkers uh, from the Romantic period. But I think that would be a really important project to put that into dialogue or to contextualize what we see as a very Euro-focused um, model of, of education. And I would be happy if you can send references my way. <laughs> That's what I have to say about that. <laughs> yes? Um, could you uh, repeat the question you were asking about? I did a project that is similar to what you're asking about. Could you repeat the question? I was just kind of asking like how you could, how like how do we then fit these narratives into the history? Because so far we've been looking at the 18th and 19th century, but mm -hmm. so many of these centers existed in the 12th century and the 10th mm -hmm. century. So like where does it fit in into the global narrative as well? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, I mean yeah, I mean I don't know quite uh, what I looked at is um things uh, the developments in like the Islamic world in age and um you know uh, like Avi and um, another philosopher uh, Al Ghazali and. Uh, um, Al Farabi and um, yeah, they also had a very uh, the way they looked at the uh, world, or like the way the things that they looked at in education were quite similar to how we view liberal education even now, and um, mm -hmm. the kind of models they used about uh, um, you know the, uh, astronomy. And uh, he had a one of them had a, a hierarchy uh, of kind of the way he described the sciences, and that's yeah similar to that. Century for a while, and um, he what he describes in the first part of, of the essay is sort of that refers back to that first quote, or the, the, the previous quote, is that he sort of he thinks in these neoclassical kind of <coughs> categories of aesthetics and cannot accommodate Gothic arch architecture. And then he looks at it again and again, and he visits the cathedral every morning and kind of describes how he is this experience of contemplating it and comes up with a new kind of language. And what is new about it is, first of all, this emotion-driven language of, of affect, of, um, of also describing his inability to really fully accommodate what he sees. And that's quite a, similar to uh, what critics like Schleimacher or Herder would say with regard to certain rich literary texts from the religious context or the secular, the secret, the secular context. And, and thereby what happens is when you, when you sort of say that a text is great once it activates my imaginative capacities, then you radically broaden the canon, right? Because you no longer just look at, I need to look at the Greco-Roman tradition because of how it's composed, because of meter, because of topics, but you completely shift um, the emphasis to uh, kind of new standards of value and taste that become open. And that's also something that, that then, then you kind of find in the history of, in the intellectual history of, um, of, of, of the humanities, the broadening towards the opening up of the canon towards modern literature. That you start looking at contemporary literature. And that you look at then, in America, you, the transformation of the commonplace. Yeah, that someone like Emerson could say, wow, the Boston Common is a place for an aesthetic experience. 
or Hawthorne who says, well, I'm no longer Shakespeare, or um, that sort of I have New England, or um, um, a whale ship was my Harvard at my Yale, yeah? So with Moby Dick, that is the, the sort of the, the objects of, of, of having this sort of intense experience become limitless in a way, and that's new and inconclusive, right? That he says, in the, since you directed my attention again to this quote, complete that what is begun until it reaches into the clouds, right? So he puts himself into the shoes of Stein, um, what he thought was the architect of the, of the cathedral, Erwin von Steinbach, and thinks that he also sees this as an inconclusive project that is beyond his control, right? And as we also know from writing our own texts, they escape us to a certain degree. Um, Emerson would say, sort of, my own words return to me with a certain alienated majesty, yeah? So you think, like, you read something again, whether it's a work of literature or your own writing, you return to it and you see things in a different light. And that's the same with great work of literature, depending on when you read them in your life, they have, ta they have a different meaning. And that is new, right? I mean, that's, that's very different from saying there's a very set canon that we teach, that we read, that we memorize. Yeah, that's what I mean. And that's where I see sort of the links to, to, uh, to other fields. Does that clarify things a little bit? Yeah. Yeah. I was just kind of thinking about what you were just saying then about the kind of relaxing of the canon and what you were talking about before about um, like recruiting members of academic staff who of also artists. Yeah. What do you think that means in terms of like the accessibility of academia? Because obviously mm -hmm. traditionally the academic world has kind of existed in its own bubble and it's just like scholars mm -hmm. talking to one another. Do you think that that maybe facilitates more of a conversation with the public, including people who perhaps are normally excluded? So I think that is that is sort of the um, the ideal, <laughs> well, the ideal, idealistic perspective on it, and the more practical, the more pragmatic one is that the humanities obviously have a problem with declining enrollments, and that they try to make these fields attractive. And, and for young people like you, we want to attract you. you we want to um, show you that what we're doing is, is uh, valuable, and there's connections to your own life, and that you, um, can learn something that you can profit from from what we're doing and that uh, all your artistic interests are also accommodated in one way. I think that is one reason for for why major universities are hiring people with these kind of profiles. By the way, I mean, just because it's, it's more um, driven by university politics, that doesn't make it a bad thing at all. I mean, I'm obviously believe in what I'm doing, otherwise I wouldn't be standing here, I would have chosen a different <laughs> profession, so I think there is an uh, intrinsic value <coughs> to that, absolutely. Um, but we have to, we cannot take it for granted, we have to somehow um, do what we're doing right now, talk about it. It's not something that is sort of automatically, I think, agreed upon, given, and, and clear. But, I mean, this is what your conference is there for, I think to precisely talk about that, among many other things. This, what do you think? Yes? Mm -hmm. <laughs> can, I add to, yeah. can I add to this? It's very interesting. Who asked this question? It's very interesting you asked this question because uh, it's connected to ownership of knowledge. And that's a very Western con concept, because knowledge is owned. So a text is owned by a person or a story or narrative is owned by a person. And so I just attended a session on repetition, and this idea of nach anum in non-Western countries is so that ordinary people could access materials which were very sort of the classical texts. I mean, we there is there is ownership of ownership of knowledge also in non-Western contexts, but it's less and less so. So the printing press and the idea that knowledge, like Nietzsche owns this text, <coughs> is very much a Western context. So the, the opening it up to ordinary people and lay lay people is difficult in that sense. So I mean, it's, I've summarized something that I've heard elsewhere, but that's my take. It's very interesting. 
Yeah, is it done? How would you argue for this difference between the approach to the ownership between Western and non-Western? I'm looking, I'm sorry, I don't want to take this, but I'm only thinking of narratives, which, for example, I should give proper examples. So for example, many African traditions, stories are retold and retold and retold. So all the knowledge that is derived from that becomes non uh, anonymous. You wouldn't be able to trace it back to a particular uh, person. Whereas Shakespeare owns Hamlet. It belongs to him, although there's been contestation. So I am, we can discuss this outside, but I'm, I'm summarizing something which is beyond the scope of this lecture, but just to go back to that idea. Suchita, I would try to articulate this clearly. With all the conversation that we've been having, I was wondering, it seems like education or building is, it's a process. And if we were to consider what Goethe talks about this sort of phenomenological experience mm -hmm. as the first step that opens you up to this um, possibility or, or just even triggers in you the desire to learn and mm -hmm. makes you think, I want to learn something. I was wondering, and then if you, if you, if you think that the relevance of associating a particular text or whether it's art or literature mm -hmm. to a certain historical figure or time comes later. But in this initial experience that you, after which you go in completely blind and vulnerable, what is the role of the teacher? Well, I mean, I think the, the modern role of the teacher is to be more of an assistant to a certain degree. I mean, if you if we were discussing a, a Goethe text together, I would obviously ask you first what you what you thought, and would then hopefully in a good class uh, take on the responsibility and precisely negotiate this uh, kind of balance your <coughs> imaginative drive and what you think <coughs> the text is about with my knowledge about Goethe, about his work as a whole, about what place. Um, the text has, among other places, how it has been discussed. I think there are always, in all literary scholarship, there are always these three dimensions. There is the the text as a historical um, as a historical um, object um, that emerged, that was written in a certain time at a certain place by a certain author. Then there's the reception history, right? Sort of the secondary literature on the text, what people have said about it. Then you can see, I mean, that, that always tells you something about the history of the discipline, sort of depending on whether you read a text from the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, yet that the, the responses to that particular text always reflects, his, reflect um, historically what was going on in the academy at this particular time. And I would be with that more familiar than you probably because I just studied it more and I, I've sort of done um, uh, that, that job for longer. And then our present age, and I think in a good class, I would do, I would respond to all three dimensions. I would talk to about the text and, and its reception history. Um, I would talk about the text in its historical context, would have more knowledge about this simply because I studied that period and would be able to connect it uh, to other contemporaries of Goethe. And then we would talk about it now, yeah? And I think that's the role of the teacher, to not tell you how to read it, but to make you aware of what should be taken into consideration by a scholar who wants to um, articulate an informed position on, 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 some, on the meaning of, of a text. <laughs> there was something I saw. Um, just a moment ago, but I think that maybe the role of the teacher can be equivalent to the role of the artist. Um, that 
not to, like to be a guide or like to post something or like to point at something and say like look at that like I want you to look at that and then not to impose but rather to suggest mm -hmm. and I think that these two roles can be quite similar um, especially nowadays so. the artist mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The, like I mean it's interesting to compare the role of the artist mm -hmm. and the role of the teacher um, in, in, in this aspect, so. yeah I think but I think um, <coughs> well there's a good saying that says, well, inspiration comes from a prepared mind that still, you know, you need to know, or at least that's why, it, w w what you're talking about. And it can't be that anyone can just teach Goethe at a liberal arts college. I would assist, insist that you need a certain training and you need to know the period and you need to be familiar with the discourses. And it's something that I wouldn't just give to a friend, right? I mean, that's why I went, uh, who I like and who's smart, but who knows close to nothing about a period. That doesn't mean that he or she can't say something about the text, but to teach it, I think, you should have, I mean, <coughs> you should be no not knowledgeable. You could, could, should need to be able to um, bring your expertise effectively into the classroom discussion and thereby guide your students. Um, at least that's what I always, try to do in my classes.